Right, oh, g'day, money miners. Jesus Christ, boys, there's some bloody tickets to go through here, mate. This is action packed show. We're trying to do a quick one for a little event this army, but mate, it's, it's all happening. It's all happening, mate. IGO, develop Sierra Rutol. Mate, he's my new favourite MA deal. Oh, mate, Tra- this is really prick Trav's ears. My favourite MA deal of the year. Perseus update, Meteoric, ASM, mate, Spartan Calidus, Firefly or Firefly equivalent, uh, and G- bloody Global Lithium. We're catching up with a bit from yesterday, but Jesus Christ, he's all go now. Look, yeah. Speaking of yesterday, something came out that was a catalyst in the wrong way for IGO. So if you look at the IGO stock graph here, just for the last five days or so, tracking along nicely, just minding its own business, then enter the Hoff with a research note and have a look at this, just crated today and we are going to get right into the Hoffs. (laughs) Broke a report on IGO. (laughs) Normally you see IGO down 5% or whatever and you think – well, well, let's check out the other lithium stocks, but they, they're all like up today. The, the Pilbara's up, Mins is up, like the other producers are up. You're just sort of thinking, well, Mate, that, those, something's happened at IGO. Those commodity price emails that we get in the morning, there needs to be a Hoff line. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, mate, talk about moving the markets. All right, boys, let's get it. JD, you've gone right into the bloody Hoff's uh, IGO note. We don't usually talk broker notes, but this is bloody, he's done some good work here. We're happy to talk about the sale reports, mate, because we, yeah, we yeah. assume they're not conflicted. <laughs> yeah, pretty pretty rare. Like you said, Matty, we don't normally talk about individual broker reports. And this one was pretty interesting. So a lot of it's derived from this report that came out from SRK Consulting on the on the Green Bushes so we're going to get into that. We're also going to get into his analysis of their track record in M&A. And that's more to do with nickel. Obviously, Greenbushes was a pretty good deal. But, you know, he, he's bearish the stock, like you point out, Trav. He says on his numbers, they trade at 1.4 times NAV. So a bit overvalued in, in from his point of view. So why don't we start with Greenbushes and what he, what he sort of makes of this. So like I said, a lot of it has come out the back of this consulting report because IGO had not really updated the market with an awful lot of info on green bushes. And, you know, granted, they are a, a part owner in this business. So there, there is that fact. But we're going to talk about three specific areas in which Tim and his views differ from consensus. So the, the first one, mate, you point to is issues with recoveries at CGP2. You know, what, what, is the, what is the report kind of peel back there? Yeah, so w- why this is quite a big deal is because you have f- follow-on impacts because the same design applies to CGP3, CGP4, and then the, the life of mine plan. So, you know, they, they need to get this right. So the SRK report, that noted that the recoveries to date have been underperforming expectations. And like I said, if you're modelling that same design out, you know, multiple more times, that can severely hit your, um, you know, your recoveries flow through to your production, your unit costs are, are higher and all this sort of stuff. So it's about 10% less though. Yeah. Like mo- modeling that it was underperforming. First wasn't actuals. It? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, about the, 67% versus modeled 78. That's right. So the, the minimum sort of difference is 9%, but it on other periods it had been even greater. So that, that is quite a big gap and it had been sort of closing over the, the couple periods shown, but, you know, the challenge really remains, you know, lower grades leads to lower production, leads to higher costs, and then, you know, you have a more accelerated depletion of the, the resource. And, mate, I keep hearing that uh, recovery is a function of grade as well. Mm. <laughs> lower grades, lower recovery. Yeah. So, I mean, that that leads us into the, the second point, a declining production or grade profile. And, you know, on his numbers, the grades are expected to decline 23% over the next 10 years. So again, IGO has, you know, been pretty light on in their disclosure on the life of mine plan. So essentially SRK, the the model provides an update, which Tim has sort of flushed through. And you'd imagine a lot of the other brokers will start to derive, um, you know, model out the the implications of this. And maybe we'll see some, some more updates from other brokers. But the life of mine plan currently modelled out to 2041. The strip ratio rises from four to six over the next 10 years. And you've also got the grades declining from 2.25% down to 1.73% over the next 10 years. And 
this all sort of leads into higher costs than anticipated. So, Matty, you'd, you'd plucked out the number here, but um, what he said was that there's the street, so all the other sell side analysts had been undercalling costs by US $145 million per year. Pretty pretty significant and you know that's that's quite a undercooking if you if you like and well, can it's have, that two hundred million Aussie. Yeah. But yeah, about that two hundred million Aussie. So you've got the added challenge of IGO not being able to do an awful lot, although they said they'll be supportive, you know, they are um, a non controlling partner. They don't operate the mine. They haven't operated an, an open pit mine or a blending strategy or a spodumene flotation plant. So, I mean, we can pull up a, another chart, which we'd come across not too long ago, and you can see that only 57% of the board have mining experience. So it doesn't bode well. Yeah, and I mean, I mean like Hoffy's report, it, it points out that Greenbush is absolutely is a tier one asset, but he, he makes the point it's not being run like a tier one asset should be run and IGO in the position that they're in with the way that that, that JV structured is they're hamstrung to do anything in that sense, really. I mean, they'll, of course they'll talk to being able to do stuff. They'll talk to be able to make decisions collaboratively with Tianchi and et cetera, and Melbourne Mile. But the reality is they can't, what can you do as a, you know, as a non-controlling joint venture um, interest party that's not operated? You can't, I mean, like you can't do anything. Yeah. And I think when you say like, being run by like a tier one asset it's sort of when it is tier one and there is so many it's so forgivable like when you've got such high grade and the lithium prices were the way they were like you don't like pff, whether you're optimized or not you're going to still going to make a shitload of money but the landscape's changed so much now that as you said great if grades start declining and the lithium price is a lot lower you got to put the boots on and try and uh, operate like you're a marginal producer. Well, Definitely. They mightn't have been ever uh, in this period, probably never been put under that pressure. I'm sure they were before um, before lithium prices went up, but it wasn't at the scale it is now either. So Definitely. Now, you, you guys say that there's, you know, not much they can do about that, but here's something they can do about their M&A track record. They, <laughs> they can, going forward, you know, make better decisions. So Lithium good, nickel bad. Yeah. Oh, pretty, except Nova. <laughs> well, no, well, we're going to get into that. So yeah. he chucked in a, a chart of IGO's bids, the timing of their bids overlaid over the nickel price. And we're talking about Nova almost 10 years ago now, 20, mm. 2015. Um, Panoramic, obviously that didn't um, bear, bear fruit in terms of a full acquisition, but you can see that when they put the bid in, Silver Knight as well as Western Areas. So all of these were launched around times of periodically high nickel prices. And he challenged... The assertion, Matty, that the uh, the Nova acquisition had been a good deal. So he, he maintains that it, it's a great asset, but it's very hard to pay a premium for a company or you know a single asset company essentially buying Nova, sink in all the capital and the you know take the time to do that, and then earn enough capital for that deal to be NPV positive. You know, yeah. and we'll we'll chuck up a chart now. I think his um his numbers showed that it was it had an NPV of negative 600 odd million. So not a, not a great deal. And so, so you're saying that negative, okay, for the money they've put in and the money they've made, it's NPV. Negative. negative yeah. So the, Jesus Christ, I'll you, discount what I stupidly said at the start. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but in that the, equation, you've got to chuck in your acquisition price that you paid. Yeah. And I think what they pay, like 1.8. Yeah. 1.8 billion. So, so hefty. Yeah. And then obviously all the cash flows in those early years to, to build the thing as well. And, you know, all the future cash flows, whilst they might look big, they're being depreciated by quite a few years at that yeah. point in time. And 10-year mind life, like 10 and a bit year mind life, like, might be a lot different if it was 15. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, when it's uh, – when you, you don't get to bear the fruit, JD. Absolutely. And this is super pertinent, Maddie, because you look at where IGO is right now and they've got a mine that they don't operate and, yeah, or say in a couple of years' time, they've got a bunch of nickel assets on care and maintenance. So – what do they do? How does how does the company sort of grow? As a shareholder, do you trust them to allocate the the cash flows that they ought to receive in an effective way? It's a it's a pretty serious question that you have to ask as a shareholder. Now, granted, the Greenbushes deal was a great one that was very good, but all the other deals they've done, you know, you you don't look back on with um, a real feel of positivity. I think you know they they've been quite wasteful and. The, the sort of perception around them has really changed, in my opinion, in, in recent times on the back of Nickel, obviously not 
doing so well, but it's interesting to actually look at the deals individually and sort of see were they value accretive and by and large, they, they haven't been. And you look at the, the Western areas one in particular, because they're doing a bit of a, a post-mortem right now. They, they touched on it in their half yearly. I think they were a bit light on about half a page for a deal that in 18 months has torched mm. over a billion dollars. Like they promised to review, you know, in, in, in the, um, the analyst calls, they promised to review that and shareholders got half a page yeah. in the half year accounts. That's not a, that's not, it's not good enough. No. And, and Tim pointed out that nickel prices are only actually 10% lower now from when the, the initial bid was launched. So you can't put it all down to this terrible nickel environment. And what Tim said in his report is that the investment failure was down to their inability to deliver a project, which they, you know, which he added, they suffered from last minute decisions being made and ultimately just poor DD. So it's... um. It's not something you really want to read as an IGO shareholder, but it's something you need to be upfront about and assess because that is the the position the company's going to be in in a few years again. And are they going to make the right decisions is the big question. They made a they bet on the nickel price, um, even though the price was different when they bought it was not that far off. They they were having a big bet on future nickel, and it hasn't. It just has not paved out. Would would the nickel price? have like let's say the nickel price didn't fall would would cosmos still have been a calamity well i don't think was that, was that think, a technical mate, issue was I, it re- oh, i think it's uh, it's both right yeah well they they've they've abandoned a, a, the only what reason you could abandon a shaft when it's 90% complete is that you do not want to spend any more money on it yeah mm. Like yeah, <laughs> you've got you've, you're that close. Well, it sounds a, just the ropes had to be put on and excavate the crusher chamber and everything. So you hear the all the hard work's done, and you hear you hear the rumours about <coughs> you know what went wrong there, but that they don't come out of IGO's mouth. That there's a, a real inability to reflect and say we fucked up in our technical due diligence. This this project was a dud, and we mm. paid top dollar for a dud. Yeah, and and you know Hoffy, like to his credit, he puts he puts red bloody squares around the board members that were there and approved that transaction and are still on the board. There's four of them. And, he, you know, he, you hear it in the way he questions on the analyst calls. Mm-hmm. There's a, you know, he, he, like good, good on an analyst for, for actually kind of wanting companies to be held to account for the, for the bad deals that they tick off on because, um, so that, like in all honesty, so they should. Yeah. It's, that's nickel, but it might've been, it mightn't have been a bad deal if it went up to $15 a pound or these crazy prices back then that everyone's predicting, but things change. LFP batteries rose and it's just not a nine pound, nine buck a pound mine. Mm. Kilometre deep. It's not like a, if it was 4% nickel maybe, but it's mm. just, it's not. <laughs> There's one other interesting aspect, not related to IGO specifically and I'd, probably going to ask an open-ended question without any answers, but can Accord have an interesting ability to release research reports and there to be a material impact in the markets? And I wonder if it's to do with the fact that they've got a bit of a, a wealth management business and the the research can be received by a, a bigger base of clients. I'd, I'd be interested to look at the numbers and see where the buying and selling has sort of come from, but we've seen it in a couple of companies where a research report comes out and it's a bit, you know, counter consensus, you know, Bit contrarian, and it seems to have quite a material impact. It's just an interesting thing I've anecdotally noticed. I think you'd, it wouldn't be a big sample to go through all the um, sell side research reports that have had a sell on them because no, there's not there's not heaps in the industry. No, I not noticed it on the buy side as well, though. Oh, the, really? The yeah. buy side ones had a material impact. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, interesting. job for a, a uni student doing finance on us. Just uh, yeah, <laughs> coming for an internship. That'd be bloody interesting. It's like a Rick Rule job. Yeah. We're just not Rick Rule. <laughs> Maybe in fifty years. Oh, oh mate, I couldn't get over the like. They have just the capex number and everything. What did it say? Capex for budget for FY twenty four eight hundred fifty to nine hundred fifty million. That is huge. Because look here. They've got to start trimming that if this lithium price doesn't recover. And one way to do it, it's small breadcrumbs, but they better not buy any fricking vehicles or outlay capital they don't need to when KCA are offering to hire the shit to them. Ivan Vella, <laughs> like, listen out. Ivan, mate, Ivan, it's, as I said, it's breadcrumbs, but every little bit counts when they're in this position. It's just that mentality. Mate, Adam Wilson and KCA could have a positive influence on the outcome here for IGO and possibly even get a mention in Hoffy's note. (laughs) (laughs) 
quite possibility. And they're not just underground specialist boys. They can help the open pits too, the sur- the flatbeds, the service trucks, the water carts, mate, the light vehicles and the buses. They could be flying around green bushes. Mate, they need to – you need to think big. You need to think small as well. Every little bit counts in the bloody – in reducing CapEx. So Adam Wilson, he'll just bear the risk for you. Oh. KCA will bear the risk. Yeah, Ivan Vela, just just utilize it, Adam. Thank you for putting putting your cock on the block to bloody at risk for the to save the industry, yeah. which is what could just happen here. So bloody beautiful. Um, oh jeez, develop. Oh, mate. they got a new mining contract. Oh, mate, they do. They do. They got a development contract at Carora's yeah. Beta Hunt. Not a mate, big one, but in the bloody in the in the region, right near mm. Pioneer Dome, right near Mount Marion. They're setting up the Goldfields Hub because like, Beta, Beta Hunt's actually an owner operator mine. Developer just getting like a a separate short term contract they're not taking over the contract they're they're heading out to the fletcher deposit so it's like th- about three k's worth of development like decline accesses vent drive a few sub levels but um it, one jumbo take them about eight months or quicker uh but mate i'm sure if they get it done quicker and add a schedule they'll be get offered more pieces of the pie to develop there so it will be developed or corora by that point though so, yeah, I mean, will it be, sorry, Corolla or, or Romelius? Almost, <laughs> almost. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? In my head, I said the right Well, see, thing. I reckon that uh, that leaking of the deal has, you know, really pissed off some people. So we'll see if that, <laughs> that deal still gets up. Oh, uh, yeah. I think end of the week, the exclusivity period, I think, something like that. So we'll probably hear a bit more, hear mm. a bit more next week about it. But, mate, this is, this is what, this is the job for develop, but... This is their niche. It's in the name. Jumbo contract, just friggin' hammer it. You can only, boys, you can only get meters as quick as the bloody jumbo operator is, mate. You can have good boggers, good charge up, good fitters and everything, but the main bottleneck is the skill of the jumbo operator. And when you pay the most in the industry, you're going to get the best one. To get, You're going to get the best one and get the best utilisation. So Funny mate, how that works. Mm, the mine, but their mining services, the revenue is – Increasing, they're talking about in FY25, 175 yeah. mil. Matty, we care about margin here, but it's about, care cash about the margin. In the door. So, I reckon they'll make contracting's hard. It is, they make maybe 15 million bucks EBITDA off, off that revenue. Yeah, so, so you what's know, that about eight, eight, nine percent? So, yeah, that we're purely thumb sucking there. Yeah, so. in, in and around that area, look, looking at around what people kind of value that mining services part of the business at, it's sort of in that 12 to 10 to 12 percent. Uh, you know, portion of the the net asset value. There. Yeah, and look, just to think, right? It takes to earn say fifteen mil EBITDA. Obviously, a lot of work goes in. You got to run the Bellevue contract, the Mar- Mar- Marion contract, this one, a lot of work because um, it's contracting. Much easier to pour gold and and copper to get a shitload of cash in the door. But I just, it's for so much for develops in terms of developing the future of the company like having that arm is people know they've got the capability to operate mines they they just become so appealing to companies whether it's just for their contracting services or better like project jvs or bit of like equity in other projects which is what bills talked about from the start because they've got that mining services capability exactly the same as minres being the partner they can do this for you and developer the same for the underground so this like mate they'll be looking at spartan and things like that trying to get contract there like this is these start off contracts getting the foot in the door um this is where they'll where they'll bear the long term fruit, I think. Mm, and there's a bit of an update on on Mount Marion. Obviously, the the other one of the other contracts that they've got in today's announcement too. Yeah, so first, what is it? First development cut schedule for May. So, yep. I, I, buddy, someone sent me the wrong message. I thought they'd already fired it, but they must have started firing the box cut and getting yep. that ready. But haven't actually fired the started the actual jumbo work. So. Yeah, it'd be interesting to interesting to see, but uh, we haven't because we haven't talked about much about Corora. T- typical when they're not listed on the ASX, you don't talk about them much. But <laughs> we had a bit of a, a spiel, obviously, in and around the the M and A, the proposed, yeah, yeah the rumored yeah. M and A. But I've not I've actually looked at um, Beta Hunt, but because they, as I said, it was a nickel mine originally, and it's been but, a game changer for them. Yeah, very much so. So because they, I think their nickel's slowing up. I think they're 
Um, oh, it's fuck They've only got about like yeah. 5,000 tonne of ore coming out a month it's, for the nickel. It's a gold company. Yeah, because yeah. BHP's, that can be out of concentrated shutting down. I think that if that changes um, for whatever reason in the future, I think there might be more nickel coming out of Carora. But, mate, that beta hunt heading to a 2 million tonne per annum gold mine. So, because they bought, they bought Higginsville. That's 1.6 million tonne. They bought that in 2019 for 50 mil. They then bought the 1 million tonne uh, Lakewood mill in June 22 for 80 mil. And that's so they sort of like they got the mine in the middle of the two mills. So a million goes to Lakewood. Then I think 700,000 tonne goes to Higginsville. Then they're ramping that up so they'll have a million going to Higginsville. So like 180,000 ounces at 18. 1900 all in sustain and what'd you say the market cap was 700 mil uh last time i looked it was 850 850 so yeah god if you compare it to bloody what genesis are doing 120,000 ounces and what are they north too call it about that something like that so yeah so and if you want to look at another uh interesting non-asx company in that area that i think is worth having your expertise look at so I'm hearing that Goldfields at um, St. Ives and Invincibles is just a, a, a phenomenal story at the moment. Like the amount of money that that is printing um, yeah. is just freaking insane. So I reckon, you know, in a future, future mm. day, mate, you've got to look into that one. Yeah, they only operate those sort of assets. I'll have to have a look. Well, it, the, the, the expiration success that they had with Invincibles that is just like completely transformed that. And it's and it's just delivering serious fruit for Goldfields in a way that was, you know, not expected when they oh. before that discovery. Oh, it, it sounds good for them, Trav, mate, because if you've got the big pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, mate, pays for the development. But if the big pot of gold's there, I don't know, Carora, this Fletcher's going to be like an invincible, but, mate, you got to be – you got to you got to minimise how much this development costs and – there better be some frickin' smack VSDs going in that Carora bloody decline in those levels and everything to minimise the cost of that development. Because one, I would think, why the hell isn't there? You, fun fact, if you want to get into science, you know ventilation, fan speed and power, there's a cube relationship. So if you drop the fan speed by 20%, you save half the power. 20%? Really? Yep. Wait. So if your fan speed goes from 100% to 80% on your secondary vent, it uses 50% less power. There you go. Wow. Cubed relationship. Wow. Courtesy of the Smet Power and Technology Mathematical Department. Physics, mate. Mate, that, Marty, that is... Marty Law, he was made high distinction in maths. Well, that 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 is extremely compelling of why you would want to be able to have And that's, have that's just 100 control. to 80. Wow. Like, imagine if you go below that, you're using yeah. absolute bloody stuff all so you don't want to use like unnecessarily use nah. a cubed amount of fucking power mate nah. yeah. and mate couple it with the bloody vent on demand system that detects the machinery going in and out of the levels which dials the fan up and down mate it's it is an absolute no-brainer no point blowing the shit out of your vent bag if you don't need a 20 220 kilowatt fan blowing off its tits so a smack vsd is mandatory from now on for all underground mines in Australia. And mm. if there isn't, we will be asking questions and they're not going to be favourable. So get a hold of Smack and get a VSD. Oh, God. Lovely, I'm mate. sick of repeating myself. <laughs> Bloody hell, mate. All right. Trav, your m a masterclass, Sierra Ruto, yeah. one of my, the top of my watch list. This this has got it all, mate. This um this is a really 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 interesting. I'm sitting back and vaping and enjoying the yeah. show here. Give it to me, baby. Mate, this is oh like we're talking like you know there's so many different parties, commodity traders, government, like you know shareholders, mining contractors. It's just like a a shit show. I, th I don't think shareholders are going to win out here, but the story is good nonetheless. Right. Um, so bear with and me. Why is that? Well, Tell the narrative. There's a, there's a backstory. Um. And, and look, there's. do you guys know much about like Sierra Retail at all? Just to, oh, to start only with. when you've mentioned it. It's been out of Iluca a couple yep. of years ago now. Exactly yep. right. Asset. Sierra Leone. Asset in Sierra Leone. That's 100% right. Keep, the, keep away sense. from Ebola. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the Area 1 deposit, which, uh, you know, the asset that is what well, was producing, that – is apparently accounts for twenty percent of the world's supply um, of, of Rutile. Exactly. So yeah, well, look, yeah. in that case, like it's a meaningful um, contributor to global supply. So hence, you know, if you're a commodity trader, mate, that makes a difference. But that, keep, keep keep that fact in mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Iluka, they were back in the day. They were you know 
bloody they were high on demerging stuff. Remember they demerged to Terra and they're like, oh, how good's this? Got a rewrite. Um, and then they thought, well, fuck, we can't sell Sierra Retail, so we may as well bloody just demerge it. No one, no one's buying it. So they demerged it. Happy days. Now that then they became this Australia only company, and Sierra um, was off to the races on its own, back listed on the ASX um, in its own right. However, share price tipped eighty percent after that. And look, since late last year, there were some interesting developments at the company. In October, there was some media speculation that Sierra Retail was in discussions with the government regarding renegotiation of the terms of the Area 1 fiscal regime. In November, Sierra Retail came out with the news that they'd lost a battle in the High Court of Sierra Leone, defending litigation from a company called Transcend. And in the same announcement, they disclose they are also party to at least three other litigation proceedings in the High Court of Sierra Leone. One relates to a class action by landowner representatives, another one related to crop compensation, and then the contents of the others were undisclosed. That's one place I would not want to go to court at, Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone High Court, yeah. Nah, that'd, yeah. that'd be like, shit, yeah. got to really take a good yeah. look at myself here. Yeah. Other, other, Me other high courts, they're, they're fine. Nah, Sierra yeah. Leone, that'd be a rough one, I yeah. reckon. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so you get the sense that Sierra Retail's social license is pretty fragile from those revelations, don't you? And their, their major, well, one of their major shareholders, Perpetual, you know, well-known fund, um, they, I think, start getting spooked and it appears they begin selling down their 16.5% stake in the company in pretty fast order. In January, the company is halted and the fiscal regime rejig with the government gets disclosed or at least what the government wants to do. So get get this, the government of Sierra Leone wanted to scrap the fiscal regime agreed in 2021 in favour of the regime that was in place in 2001 and they wanted to apply that retroactively starting July 1st, 2023 and to kind of grasp you know, the full impact of what that regime change would mean. I'll, I'll read this from Sierra Rutile's announcement in January. These are the concessions that they um, were, were getting, but it would revert to the other way. Withholding taxes of 0.5% rather than 5.5%, fuel duty of 1% rather than 12%, um, royalty on sales at a rate of 0.5% rather than 4%, and a minimum corporate tax of 0.5% rather than 3.5%. It's a lot, right? And they, they basically say that, you know, heck, it's area one is uneconomic with, with uh, if you have to revert back to back to that, which is pretty clear when you <laughs> factor those implications mm. on. That that tax is on revenue as well. There's a, a quirky one. It's not how we normally mm. think about tax. Yeah. Yeah. M- meanwhile, Perpetual decide they don't want to be caught up holding the bags of a perpen- potential arbitration entity, I assume. So by the end of Feb, their position... They've trimmed it down all the way to 5% from 16.5 a few months earlier. And here's where things get interesting. Who was buying those shares from Perpetual, right? On the 29th of February, leap year, two new shareholders <laughs> pop up on the register. <laughs> One of them appears to be some entities linked to Assad Yazbek and Joseph Yazbek with the entities having an address in Cyprus, British, um, British Virgin Island, and Lebanon. If you if you look at oh, it. go Lebanon, yeah. it's an heritage. <laughs> so you're like, who the hell are these people? Anyway, and then the other one was from PRM Services LLC. Their address was in San Juan, Puerto Rico. <laughs> and if you're a Sierra retail shareholder watching this, you're probably thinking, who the fuck are these guys? These are not the sort of entities you see pop up as major shareholders on ASX mining companies. So something must be up. But what and why? And on 11th of March, Sierra retail start making staff redundant at their Area 1 operations. You know, they're, they're trying to pressure the government into, you know, saying, heck, we're not going to uh, bloody put all these – we're not going to enforce – we're not going to change the Third Amendment and the fiscal regime. So they're, they're firing people and the government's simultaneously putting pressure on them, right? The following day, they add some colour about the identities of the major shareholders that popped up. The entities linked to Yazbek, the Yazbeks, is um, Mano Mining and Logistics, which – was one of the mining contractors at the company's project, <laughs> Area oh. One. The other one is linked to Gerald Group, who is you know a well-known commodity trader. <laughs> Would you believe Gerald Group? Um, and this is disclosed in the Sierra Retail announcement. They say Gerald Group also own an iron ore mine in Sierra Leone, so they clearly probably have some in-country relationships and are probably thinking they have a better social license than Sierra Retail has. I find it pretty funny the quote in the announcement from their Sierra Retail chairman. 
which says, both Gerald Group and Mano Mining and Logistics are prominent investors in the Sierra Leonean mining industry. SRX believes the recent acquisition of Sierra Retail shares by these two significant local market participants highlights the significant potential and strategic value of Sierra Retail's <laughs> assets. <laughs> no indication of, oh, fuck, we might be about to get subject to some hostile corporate action from these yeah, they're, potentially they're, unfriendly parties. <laughs> yeah, they're just not looking to do this themselves. Oh, very funny. Anyway, the next day, Gerald Group tells uh, – Gerald Group clearly complains about being uh, you know identified um, with, with RPM and the, there's another announcement that goes up saying that Gerald Group is not associated with PRM but they – but PRM is associated with Craig Dean who is chairman of – and CEO of Gerald Group. So Craig Dean has control of PRM, not Gerald Group. It's all confusing. Yesterday is when things really crank up. PRM launches an on-market takeover offer of Sierra Rutile after scooping up an 11% pre-bid stake itself at this point. The offer is you know, nine and a half cents per share. It was a pretty modest premium, especially on VWAP sort of metrics, um, implying $40 million total equity to Sierra Rutile, it's on market, which means you know, SRX shareholders can literally sell into the offer immediately for, for their 9.5 cents. And this is this is super rare. We talk about deals all the time, but the, there's only one other on market takeover in the entire time we've been, been doing the podcast. And that was um, Wailu Mincor. That was on market. Right, but, be- right before the potty started. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, literally. I yeah. still remember that buy order. Mm. Yeah. The biggest buy order you'll ever see. It was freaking yeah. ridiculous. Junkie. Whatever it was, 140 yeah. million shares, a dollar forty or something. Yeah. Yeah, just sat there forever. And Har- <laughs> Harvest Lane beat him to the bloody. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Wild they, uh, they got the a priority yeah. on the order. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty funny. Well, I love this shit. Like, it, it's it's actually it, really clever, the strategy here. If you, if you don't own. SRX shares and you, you just sort of want to be impartial and comment on m and strategy, I think this is really clever because Sierra Rutile is under pressure from all angles. The government is putting the gun to their throat. They're running out of cash fast. Only $8 million in the bank at the end of December. The mining contractor appears hostile towards you as well. There's a class action against you and country. You fired your staff, so they probably don't even want to work for you anymore. Um, Pressure is dialed up to the max on this company, right? And it's in those circumstances where hostile M&A can be really effective. And, and then today, another revelation, PRM Lodger 249D to oust the board of Sierra Rutile. They want, want want to remove them all and replace them with four people of, um, of their own nomination on the board. This is uh, There's one bit of good news for, for Sierra Rutile, and that's that um, one of their board members, Patrick O'Connor, he, he must be pretty familiar with 249Ds because he's um, on the board of Metals X and, and FAR, which uh, Jeremy Rapis had a bit to do with. So more pressure on the board to to deal with, but it gets worse. The government of Sierra Leone tells the company that suspending the mining operations was unlawful. More pressure from the country. Do you guys want to know what I really think is going on? Why? Here? What bloody? Oh, I think you can connect the dots there. But if 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 you if you want to connect the what would you what would you hypo- hypothesize, JD, from from all of that? From what you've said, there's more than one person. There's multiple parties working together to squeeze you being SRX. I you can't you agree. can't get that much pain by accident. Yeah, but it, <laughs> 100% I mean, agree. is it even the worst outcome if you're in such a difficult spot? Are you really going to get your your license back? Like we've we've seen we've followed many other projects that tend to be in in Africa, where you lose the social license and it's a, a long and lonely road, often in suspension. Like you you got a bit of a kicker here. Might have to just take what you can get and call it a day. Hundred mm. percent. I would like yeah. I I would venture to say that this is my speculation here. So take it with a grain of salt. I don't own shares. I don't have a position. But I'm just like looking at the series of events with uh, hopefully objective eyes. And I would venture to say that Gerald Group and the mining contractor have probably had discussions with each other. And, you know, for the purposes of however they might vote or appear and um, for the Corporations Act, they might appear independent. But in reality, they might actually have uh, an agenda together. And heck, that agenda might even be the same agenda as the government of Sierra Leone. Mm. So, like, what, what bloody hope do you have as the board of management of Sierra Retail fighting the government, your mining contractor, <laughs> the commodity trader, all at the same time. Like, is there going to be an uplift to this bid? I don't know, mate. Jeez. Like, like how, how do you win? You know, and you've got funding pressure. You're running out of money. So I kind of agree with you, JD. Just fucking take your money and, and just call it a day. And, and it sucks, but it's a part of part of being invested in Sierra Leone. <laughs> yeah. Well said, mate. That was a 
Hell of a saga. Bloody rip snorter, right? Uh, Trav, your another another thing you love in life is the battle for Nian Zaga, but it appears all but over. Mate, the checkmate has really been nearly knocked the king over, I think. Yeah, yeah. I posed the question in the last little update, you know, why didn't they go best in final? <laughs> I would have done it to really put the pressure on the throat. And it appears here's your answer. It's because all corp. Well, because Perseus were keeping one up the sleeve to offer a very marginal conciliatory victory by upping the bid, you know, a small 2.5 cents to 57 and a half cents cash now. And that way, all court board, you know, get a get a little bit of a pat on the back in the process mm. and ev- everyone's happy. You can wrap up the deal a lot quicker. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I dare say this will be the um, the the end of the road now. It's it's going to be, I'm pretty, I mean, I'm pretty certain that all court will become... Perseus. So is that when you say wrap up the deal quicker, because there was the lift, there's now something to accept or does that, how does that change it? Yeah. Like, or is it more just, it's easier to wrap it up because I'll take the extra cash. Totally. It's just, it's just, you don't have, you don't have any more like going back and forth and trying to get an uplift and saying, yeah. no, we don't accept it. There's been no change. Just like but everyone. Board save a bit more face. Board you know, save they can face. Say, you know, Perseus don't have to wait like an, another two, three months. It's just things can just end a lot faster. Can the can Silver Corp up their bid? Yeah, they got a matching right. Yeah. I don't think they'll do it. No. Yeah. No, so called well, Nick George Edder and Tim Goy to the uh, substantial shareholders for All Corp. They've sent intention statements saying that they will accept the amended Perseus offer. So yep. you can consider it all bloody done and dusted there. Right, meteoric boys. Meteoric The and rare earth clays and ASM, Australian strategy materials. Strategic minerals, that's my typo, mate. Fuck. ASM. Uh, you never do typos, JD. <laughs> Watch for the unnecessary commas in the description, everyone. Apostrophes. <laughs> Apostrophes. <laughs> Mate, it's not a bad time to be a, a rare earths player. Governments are handing out money left, right and centre. This time it's the US Export Import oh, Bank. So, do you reckon they're all talk, do you reckon they're talking to the Australian oh, bloody government as well? Because they love handing out shitloads of cash. There was an announcement earth. and it was worded quite funny. Madeline King, our resource minister, it, just the, the wording around it was funny. She... She said she was proud of the work she had done, you know, not not in the sense of it being a, a team effort or anything. I thought it was, mm. you know, taken taken a bit of credit. I don't know about that, but um, in this case, the Export Import Bank have pledged non non binding, but they've pledged US six hundred million to ASM and US two hundred fifty million to MEI. So for MEI, you know, they got the, the project in Brazil. They haven't even released a, a scoping study yet, so they're doing their absolute best to signal that they're going to get cheap debt in future and as to why this can be quite beneficial you know you get favorable terms think things like limited recourse longer durations flexible terms we've fleshed out what the uh, the arrangements around any Bloody other low interest rate yeah it can be um can be quite beneficial and that it does come with conditions you often expected or you know you often have to use uh Items that have been manufactured, say in the US, in this case, think you know Caterpillar trucks and whatnot, those sorts of things. So that's kind of why these export import agencies sign these um, these deals with companies. There was also Sprott named in the MEI report, and whilst it sounds like they're just making an introduction, I'm sure they want to get their hands on a, a bit of business in and around MEI. So I'm sure they'll be they'll be circling. We're expecting an FID in late 25 for Meteoric. Now that is very. Does that, seem, does, that, does that seem too early? That seems very quick. I mean, no study. scoping study to come out in the next quarter, you know, in less than a year and a half from scoping study to FID. Wow. They, I mean, they must be flying through things. I almost, almost commend the speed, but let's see what actually happens there. As for ASM, their FID for their Dubbo mine is expected later this year. So they're trying to go the full vertical integration route. They've got a plant up in South Korea for the, the latter stages of processing. But yeah, like I said, both of these are, are non-binding pledges. So we'll see if they actually come to fruition. But Jesus. again, not a not a bad time to be a rare earth. You can see both the US government <laughs> and the Aussie government. It is a bad uh, time if you're selling product. The price is shit. Yeah, <laughs> <bloody> developer. <laughs> if you, if you, uh, yeah, oh, if you own the equity, it's no good. But hey, mm. if everyone hates them. Rick oh. rules on them. <laughs> well, if, if all of these things get financed in reality, I don't think all of them will. In reality, but in reality, yeah. like that's a lot. It's a lot of product more to be selling into the market, yeah. which is already mm. pretty beaten up right now. Um, uh, Meteoric will be a 
bloody interesting one to see the performance of a clay. Mm. Uh, like I know Definitely. there's the one in uh, is it Brazil? I think there's a big clay rare earth. Brazilian rare earths, the company. No, is there a producing one? There's a producing one already in Brazil. No, nah, it's like Sarah, Sarah, Sarah Verde or something like that. Great, in a production great, great memory. Last year. Oh, I don't know. These things just come to me sometimes. <laughs> All righty. Spartan. Didn't, did not edit that out and check Google. <laughs> 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 oh, God. Yeah, it'll be good. good acting career if post the podcast possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Spartan. I was excited this morning. I saw an announcement come up. Spartan board changes. And I'm like, you beauty, about time. But it's the wrong director. Johnny Hotter from <laughs> Tembo is stepping down. Uh, bloody, uh, yeah. So Tembo owned, what seven, what'd you say, JD? 17.5%? Yeah, 173 I thought I, th- I thought it might have been one of either Rowan Johnson or Harden's Plagamars to dro- <laughs> drop their shared directorships from five to four. A shared, of shared directorships, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kin, Waluna, Joe Pacific. PNX and Spartan, and after hearing Rowan articulate his apparent independence at the Spartan AGM, I was left far from impressed. <laughs> but um, let's think. I was of- far from impressed with, um, yeah, the bloody the uh, Hans's uh, res- responses to ASX's. Oh query yeah, the, the um, mm-hmm. ASX query come up about that. Yeah. He's got access to the broker accounts now, oh, uh, yeah. into the trading accounts, oh, so he on. knows if the orders are good in there. So, so it's the, all good. The, the isolated incident. The, risk. the yeah. isolated incident was um, only only isolated per company because he did the same thing at Alltech. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, one company was isolated from the other. But heck, you keep your job and just get rid of <laughs> get rid of Johnny Hodder instead. All right. Oh, I like Johnny. Uh, but. Now, this poses the question about Tembo's stake. Now, remember, they were in on the recap yeah. at 10 cents. So why, why has John Hodder left the board? Why, are they – why, we don't know, but uh, is this an indication that possibly Tembo are looking to cash out of this investment, which is 6x since the recap, which is like, hey, good bloody result. Great for PA. Mm. Yeah. But yeah. – Hey, we don't need to know. We speculate. That's what we, we do. Yeah, <laughs> but let's hypothetical this seventeen and a half percent stake, which is worth thought about hundred and ten million or something around that. A bit under hundred. Under yeah. around the hundred hundred bucks. What if there's a Minres style play and someone picks it up to have a bit of a, mm. uh, just a bit of a well, not a. Just a bit of an interest in it to be a deterrent for yeah. people looking to looking to buy Spartan. So block, yeah. block trade, you can get your hands on a, a large amount of stock quite quickly. Don't have to do it on market. Yeah. Well, well, I think I think you would you 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 watch the series of events today and you see John Hodder stepping down is an indication that Tembo are probably happy to to bank their win here. A 6X in a year, phenomenal result for private yeah, equity. That good, is very, bloody good very rare. And if you step off the board, it's a, an indication that yeah, you're, you're happy with your return. They didn't participate pro rata last capital raise, another indication they're happy yeah. with their return and yeah. want to leave. So if you're if you're opportunistic and you actually are thinking of acquiring or, or you want to acquire or you want to block someone else from acquiring Spartan, you probably watch him step down and you think, I could make a phone call to John Hodder now. And maybe maybe asked to buy a line, <laughs> mm. and who would who who could opportunistically do that? Who comes to mind? Oh, well, I'd I'd scratch Romelius at the moment with the Carora discussions. Mate, right, do you think they could do it though? Because that could be a it could be a, it could be a card if they if they're just pissed well, off and don't it's want like, yeah, and it's probably it could be a card to play just for future. Um, like it's a it's a cheap way to get not a cheap way but like a, a lower cost way to get get a bit of control now for a potential um decision in the future yeah <laughs> uh do you think west gold would use some of their couple hundred buck cash to maybe take this stake they could do it too they've also got a debt facility which is um undrawn i think it's 100 bucks in the debt facility and yeah. it's, it wouldn't be a like yeah it, it wouldn't necessarily be a uh, a, a horrible move because you're buying the share. If you if you own like what is it, like seventeen percent of the company, yeah, then no one else can no one else can acquire it except for you. Like that's and then if someone did want to acquire it, you bloody get a good pay on your <laughs> pay on your investment. But you don't you, you don't do it if you think they're overvalued. If like if you know if Wayne and his team have done the numbers and they think this is like materially above our our view of nav, then you, you don't make mm. that phone call. But if you think it is still accretive, then you do it. Yeah. And 
look, probably the landscape's changed. As of, I think I've said this a few times, the landscape's changed for them now that they're drilling at depth and there is this increased strike length of the ore body. So, you know, West Gold, I'm sure we're looking at it at much cheaper prices. The price has gone up now, but it looks to be a bit more beefed up in of for what is in the ground. So it might actually make set like make more sense for them now at a bit of a higher price with less risk to actually deliver the ounces. But I just I just feel that mill is the biggest turnoff. That size of that mill. Obviously a bit of capital to go in to put the secondary crushing circuit in and everything, but that it's just that size of the mill for that deposit. Is that I just think it's a big deterrent. That was one and a half million ton, and they didn't have to do too much to it, and could just high grade it. I think it'd be a, such a more appealing story. That's the interesting. What do you think, JD? You got a ding, ding, ding for this? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I still own a bit. <laughs> Look at you, just fucking riding yeah, off I, my I, coattails here. I, I don't think Wesco would do it. I think mm. the um, the personal decision in the in the boardroom is a bit a bit too hard. Haven't seen it rise so quickly. You know, they could have had the opportunity. Romelius could. I I think that Corora deal might struggle now that it's sort of become public. I think that could potentially kill the deal. That would be a big bite, you know. That was 850 market cap mm. before the deal was leaked. If you if you chuck your normal sort of 20 to 30% premium on that, that's a very big bite for, for Romelius yeah. to make. Granted, you know, going, going for Spartan wouldn't be crazy amount cheaper, but still a bit of a reduction there. Beyond that, I don't. We've well, spoken about it in the past. I'm not sure who really goes I mean, for this Silver sort of Lake's, size thing. Silver Lake's too tied up with the red yeah. merger. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, like we've... Bell, Bellevue are not in the position to do it right now. No, nah. um, Capricorn wouldn't. Gold Road wouldn't. Regis, I don't think would. Capricorn wouldn't. Absolutely not. No. No. Yeah. They could run the pit. Yeah, but they. They, they buy, Nowhere buy near low. this price. Buy low. Nah, yeah. they buy low. Yeah. Uh, there'd be someone else in there. There'd be someone else who don't think they're Well, we went through them all North the American. other day. North yeah. American maybe. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. All righty. Calidus, raising money. Oh, raising the dosh. Buddy, yeah. 15 buck placement at 11 and a half cents. 30% discount to the last clothes price. So pretty steep discount. Eight million, eight bucks of it going towards debt, a debt payment, Rest for working capital. They've they'll have sixty one million in debt still remaining after this. They also get there's the old oppies attached to one for two attaching oppies to give the just to give the bloody brokers a bit, you know, at seventeen cents. So look, if the share price does go up, that's eleven mil that would come into the company if they did get exercise. Also, a share purchase plan for three bucks uh, isn't underwritten, but the company's got the right to place the shortfall if the shareholders approve it. So wow. now the big not underwritten. No. You don't say that very often. No, I suppose it's a pretty small amount, but um, now if if the 15... Or, or, it's, or, it's, or you, you don't have confidence in being able to... Yeah. yeah. So if the 15 mil placement gets away, the main placement, their debt provider Macquarie have agreed to throw in two and a half bucks into the raise. They're also going to push forward $11 million of debt repayments into the second half of FY25. Uh, I'll bring up the charts here to show this. And they're also pushing forward 21 and a bit thousand ounces of hedging into the second half of 25 onwards. So, because these these hedges are priced at 23.70 Aussie dollars per ounce. So, about a thousand bucks out of the money at today's price. So, if, if you look at the chart here, FY25 for Calidus, that'll see about 40 to 55% of their gold hedged. At this twenty three seventy, that's dependent on if they get this nullagon oxide ore to come online to lift the lift the amount of ounces. So FY twenty six about thirty five to forty one percent hedge. So get yeah, we've talked about years have talked about this before. Once you more ounces is so valuable. Once you have got this hedging constraint. So if if they say if they don't get that nullagon oxide ore in FY twenty five. That'll see 65,000 ounces produced. 38,000 of that is hedged at 23.70. So it drops your realised gold price down to 27.56, assuming 3,300, which it is today. So, yeah. Um, they're say- Calidus are saying that this will 
see 31 million reduced in their cash outflows with the hedging and debt repayments for this calendar year, but comes at the expense of a very highly dilutive equity raise. So, yeah, I, I, I think, um, I think, we've, yeah, we've talked about this dynamic a fair bit where, where they're really constrained by low production, low, a hedge book that's deeply out of the money. Um, kick, and really kick the can down the road here. They're, they're, um, yeah, they're lucky. They're lucky. They, you know, they talk about this refinancing, refinancing the deficit. There's no fucking way anyone will buy. Like, they'll be able to refinance that debt facility. Like, I just don't. I just am not a, at all a believer that anyone would buy that debt facility. Yeah, like well, that's because this isn't a refinance. To. This is just yeah, a I kick know. down the road. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But like, like who, who, which, who, in, who's going to buy that from Macquarie? Like, no way. Macquarie, they're dreaming. Macquarie's dreaming. Like, yeah. <laughs> How would – why would someone do it? Like why would you re – like – I, I mean you could you, you could you could refi it. The only person get, that would refinance it is the, the current lender on, you know, if they think they're killing all hope of getting their capital back and they can slightly cushion it and still, yeah. you know. Because if you think about it, you know, somebody's responsible for making that decision at Macquarie and they don't want to be responsible for lo- losing a good bit of money, so – but, yeah, so I mean, they're, they're, this is sort of the first stage of cushioning, just taking taking the bit of pressure off till till they ramp up. Because you see, they do ramp up at uh, FY twenty seven, but Macquarie, it's getting them to that stage. Macquarie's got every incentive to to enable the story to continue for as long as possible. If the story is good enough for new equity, I hear today to come in the door, which helps pay down the debt and helps them. Keep, stay, keep the mill running mm. for as long as possible because that delivers into their hedge book as well. So both of those, you know, are reasons why Macquarie might be supportive for 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 things like this. But um, they don't want to own the mine. No, don't, God you don't no. want to. You don't want to own the mine, and no. you don't want to take a haircut on the debt, and you don't and you don't want to have to figure out a bloody solution to the to the gold ounces of which they have an obligation to deliver. You should re-listen to our um our, our Sean Russo one because. Yeah. Like Macquarie's on the hook for a, for a fair bit just from the the dynamics that come with um the he- sure they would have hedged out the gold price that they're not exposed they hedge out the price thing they lock in a, a margin straight away but the way that this works is they're still on the hook for delivery of the ounces so Macquarie have hedged out the price risk but they haven't ris- hedged out the delivery risk so they need they need Calidus to be producing enough ounces for Macquarie not to be. Um, so have to buy them themselves. Correct. Matty, Firefly. <laughs> oh, Firefly. Bloody – the oh, this is just a great chain of events here. 4% copper is the headline. That's the first thing you see. But then you go down and they've hit – they've got nine metres of 4% copper equivalent. And I'm thinking, oh, I wonder what this is going to be. It actually wasn't that much different. It's a bit nitpicky. 3.78% actual copper. Still good. Yeah, but pretty good. They're, but they're chucking mayo on it. And I don't like you don't like mayo when there doesn't need to be mayo, mate. You, the first thing you see is this four percent copper. So, and that's part of a sixty-three point one meter zone that's grades two percent copper. So sixty-three meters at two percent, that's good. But the bloody headline just saying four percent copper when it's actually copper equivalent and just an internal bloody section of that that's something that's probably going to be bulk mined anyway, just creates doubt. Probably just deliberate to get a mention on the show, and it's worked. <laughs> but anyway, get copper anyway. in the uh, in the headline. You'll do well this oh, week. Oh God! Right, Global mm. Lithium. They must have watched the show. My, that uh, that announcement must have been sitting there waiting. Yeah. The drill aisles, Trav. It, it They're came, out. It came. It was um yeah 100, 102 or three day turnaround time, but they came. Mate, how do you feel that you have such an influence on the market? I, 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 it must be coincidence, I think. Yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> Mate, th- we do not believe in coincidence on this show. <laughs> right, oh, we better bloody get ripping. Go and fucking edit this, and we've got bloody uh, sponsor drinks. Go <laughs> look after the sponsors. And speaking of which, the Verify, the bloody get wet. DSI Underground. Oh, Smack Power and Technology. Get a freaking VSD on your site right now. Anytime Exploration Services. KCA. Brooks Airways. K-Drill. Can't wait to see K-Drill as well. Hooteroo, Money Miners. Hooteroo. 
The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.